And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the man who was currently ho who was who was earlier today hosting a eight-hour lecture on how to properly talk Minnesotan, including the Minnesotan goodbye, the Minnesotan long goodbye. Oh yeah. Not to be confused with the book, not to be confused with the Philip Marlowe book. <laughs> Good brother Xanatrix, this is the first um, episode episode of, of of Valley of the Judged in in my new place. It is good. It is good to be back doing this after having to take a bit take a bit of a of a hiatus because I was moving. But we are we are back, and we have. Monk, go ahead. Monk doesn't see all the scratches on the inside of my walls from uh, heavens and heresies withdrawals. <laughs> no H and H makes Zan a dull boy. No H and H makes Dan Zan a dull boy. <laughs> but once again, we're returning to cl two classes. Um. I do before we get into the before we get into um the class entry for this week. I do want to call I do want to play a little bit of um catch up. Because after we finished recording the what the one for the one for the um for the rogue. There was there was one more um one more addition to that to that one in turn in the, in the form of another um archetype. <laughs> Since at the time we only had um we only had four archetypes assassin, thief, alchemist, and spelunker. Um But we ended up getting a new one called Duelist with the flavor text of Stabby Stab. And I, thought, I think it would have been funnier if he said it's time to do, and it has a bunch of do do do, and then it just ends. <laughs> Tempting as that would be, it's, it's, it's um, actually, actually, I would say, I would say it wouldn't fit, but then, but then, get, but then, given the spelunker, I'm not sure if I can use that card. <laughs> the spelunker are giving, you know, the way of the entering fist. Given, I am. 110% confident that Tanner can fit a Yu-Gi-Oh meme into the Rogue just fine. Yeah. Anyway, the duel. Um, as I understand that the duel list is is essentially the answer to the Zor to the um, Zoro fantasy at, that we talked about two weeks ago. And this is the Zoro from Mexico, not the Zoro from Pirates. Mm-hmm. Which I will I will freely admit my introduction to was from the '90s cartoon. I never saw the never saw the black and white movies, and um, it was it, this was that was a few years before Antonio Banderas would bring it back with one good movie. Antonio Banderas as Zorro is a uh, still one of my favorite things. I'm not gonna lie. I I like it I like it as well. Let's just um. Uh, let's just ignore the elephant in the room that Banderas isn't isn't Mexican. <laughs> I mean, he's Hispanic enough, right? Yeah, and then then again, the same then again, um, and then again, um, our fa our favorite supposed Spaniard in Highlander isn't Spanish either. No, he's Egyptian. Except he's an Egyptian as portrayed by a Scotsman. Dressed as a Spaniard. <laughs> Dressed as a Spaniard. And with a Spanish name. Mm -hmm. Ramirez is Spanish. Oh, yeah. But. Oh, we, we, for, and we forgot had, had at one point traveled to Japan, which is why he's wheeled, which is why he's carrying a katana. I swear that. I, I want to know what drugs the screenwriter was on. The answer to that question is yes. 
But I want to know what in which specific order gets you the most fanboyish edgelord thing ever. Well, f well, f well, prob we'll probably find that we'll probably find that out as soon as soon as I figure out where Doom Rider hides his stash. Yeah. True. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh, but the fir I'd like to, before we get before we get into what the class for this week, I'd like to catch up on the duelists. And its first level feature is martial training. You gain martial proficiency in two weapon subtypes of your choice, with which you already have simple proficiency. You also gain repost. You have advantage on attack rolls made against any enemy that has hit you with an attack in this or the previous round, or in the last 10 seconds if initiative is not being tracked. You may apply the effects of your sneak attack feature on an enemy that has made an attack against you in this or the previous round, or in the last 10 seconds if initiative is not being tracked, even if you do not have advantage. Um, which def we're already, I'd say we're already off to a good start with the first level features for Duelist. Yo. Um, at third level, you gain Agrippian Geometry. Ah, uh, Grippa. Agri you gain the Blade Mastery feat and may consider any weapon you're holding to be a blade in addition to its normal weapon type, as long as you have martial proficiency with that weapon. If you already have the Blade Mastery feat, you may choose another Weapon Mastery feat instead. You are not required to have proficiency in blades to gain the benefits of this feature. If you have another weapon mastery feat, such as axe mastery or fell handed, for example, your threat range with blades increases by two. In addition, the dice type for the for the weapon only increases once rather than twice. For example, if you're wielding a one handed axe and have axe mastery, you may consider your axe to be a blade for the purposes of blade of the blade mastery feat but only increases damage dice once. You still gain all the benefits of the Axe Mastery feat. When I saw that when I saw this I had D I had DM'd Tanner say and, and and brought up it brought up one of my favorite memes with using my Marine Corps training, I can turn anything into a weapon. Even this rifle. <laughs> huh. Um you also, at third level, you also gain Compelled Duel. Once per turn, as a 15-foot quick action, you may compel a creature that you can that can see and that you can see and can hear you to duel you. The creature is compelled to actively engage you in combat or move to a range where it is able to do so if it is not within range to do so. Moving away from the compelled creature ends the compelled condition on it, and you may not use this feature if you have moved away from the creature this turn. At 11th level, the severity of the inflicted compelled condition increases by an amount equal to your tiers of expertise in the persuasion skill, 5, ma five maximum, for a total severity of 7. A maximum total severity. Yep. So yeah, we've got, we've got our... I challenge you to a duel. And remember, they inflict damage on themselves if they... Uh, if they... If they act against the the, the compulsion. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, at seventh level, you gain Benetti's defense. Increase your dexterity defense by two and your wits defense by two. At eleventh level, creatures compelled by you are also considered to be weakened too. <laughs> At you also at seventh level, you also gain silver tongued. You gain two tiers of expertise in persuasion. So, nice. Right. At fourteenth level, you gain hello. My name is. <laughs> hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. <sighs> at the beginning of a threatening encounter, you may choose to mark five yourself. If you do, you gain two damage reduction and may utilize an extra reaction in the course of a round for the duration of that encounter. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> and speaking of which, at 18th level, you gain prepare to die. 
When you compel a creature, you also afflict psychic it. The severity of the condition is equal to your wits modifier. Psychic affliction. Nice. The only thing I can really I can really say on the duelist rogue is that it is that for those who want to do the Errol Flynn or Zoro or good old Swash and Buckle, this is your class. Or the Dread Pirate Roberts. Mm -hmm. Now, with that out of my system, let's talk about sorcerers. Not to be confused with their horse, horserer. God damn it, monk. Hey, you put you put me through you put me through a bit of cringe early today. This is the receipt. You know what? I can't even be mad. <laughs> so, sorcerers when they were now technically there were the Zacharoon sorcerers in Dark Sun, but as far as I'm concerned, those don't count for the purposes of of this. Since all that was was just a different kind of spellcaster, um, or rather a different type of wizard, specifically tied to the Dark Sun campaign setting. Whereas the sorcerer that we know was introduced in third edition, for some reason Skip Williams really hated the 3.0 version, which is understandable because the 3.0 version was not very good. It was essentially a, a weaker version of um, of wizards. But the 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 idea with them was was the whole was the whole. They can't cast as many spells as wizards, but they don't have to prepare their spells. Oh, which. I'd say I'd say would I'd say would be nice except for one thing. Um, you still have you still have a certain number of spells that you can cast per e per each level. So all that you've done all that you've done is just eliminate one step. You have not eliminated the whole issue. Oh. Of course, there's there's also the fact that um. That what certainly d what certainly didn't help is sorcerers not getting as many feats compared to wizards. Even if it's only, even if it's at every five levels, once I'd say they didn't come into their own until until the concept of sorceress bloodlines started to get introduced. Yeah, I can see that. Which was implied in the in the way this in the way the description of the sorcerer was written, but you know how it is with um. With, impl with implying something that isn't in the mechanics. Rules layers. Oh. And un unlike, say, bards, they didn't have anything to to um, fall back to fall back on. Mm-hmm. Oh. And the sorcerer, it's the and um, I'd say so I'd say sorcerer. Sorcerer and Warlock are, pr are pretty much the classes that everybody goes to in 5th edition if they want to play a caster. Maybe somebody will pick a wizard if, if, they, if, they, don't ha if they aren't given the option or if they're, or, um, if they're, feeling, if they're feeling adventurous enough. I think you mean masochistic enough, Monk. That too. Oh. I... I would say, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm excluding monk. I'm excluding the 4E version of the sorcerer because they were focused on on dealing all the elemental damage. Mm -hmm. Now, monk, I just had a sudden realization that I'll get into in more detail when we go over the warlock equivalent, if mm -hmm. there is one. Um, 5E has Cowzilla instead of Codzilla. Cleric or Cleric warlock? Oh. Yeah. I can Clerics are still OP as hell. Clerics are still OP as they as they've always been. Um I can I can see I can see warlock I can see the I can see the issue with warlocks, but I'm but when we get when we when we get to that, I would like to hear your case on that. Yeah. 
Does, Definitely. Do, it's not that I don't agree. It's that it's that I want to see where we overlap. Yeah. Uh, um. The now we've we've talked we've talked about the five e sorcerer and I did earlier today I did ask um Tanner his what what he was trying to go with when it came to when it came when it came to the when it came to the sorcerer <laughs> compared mm -hmm. to it compared to its status in vanilla mm -hmm. so he had said so I actually really liked some of the ideas behind the vanilla five e sorcerer just not the exact implementation. I felt they didn't take the concept far enough on and on its own, again, not counting the broken multiclassing stuff. The base sorcerer just kind of fell flat. But the metamagic change slash idea was a great one, I thought. It just needed better implementation that worked with a consistent class. So in my redesign, I did what I felt they should have done to begin with. I allowed metamagic to affect all spells, not just spells cast by the sorcerer. And I also designed them to fit into my wit, res, and set setup with them being a Resolve class, so more focused on risk-reward, on Adrenaline, Verge of Death style play. They're also the class that gets the most spell points, recovers the most spell points, and can do the most things with spells, so they're especially tuned for the player who wants to be a pure spellcaster. Also, as he also mentioned as a side note, it's his birthday, so happy birthday. Happy birthday, Tanner! Um, that means I have to come up with a really special voice for this one. <laughs> So with that, with that said, let's let's delve into let's delve into his take on the sorcerer. And with that in mind, Zan, would you do the on? I will do the honor. <clears throat> Make no mistake. I have no disdain for wizards or druids, or heralds or inquisitors. To a certain extent, I even envy them. For they master their magic. They control it, and to be sure, they understand their magic. But they do not understand magic in and of itself. No, that right, that curse, is reserved to us alone. The sorcerers and sorceresses of the world. Only we truly understand what magic is. Chaos made manifest, the spark of the soul brought to bear on the physicality of the world. Resonance is etched within our very flesh. But again, we are not limited to the mastery of our own magic. We master the magic of others. We can change its shape, house it in our bodies, bend it to our will, warp it, counter it, feed off of it. Through blood and ire, we sustain it. Have you ever witnessed a lightning storm housed within a raging torrent? Would you like to? Quinn, Tempest of the Central Sea, Elemental Sorcerer. <laughs> uh, so, so, I'd that's that's certainly going to be an interesting approach, and I could. Um, why do I get? What, I I keep getting flashbacks to '90s X Men Storm. <laughs> I don't know why. Especially with the whole Quinn Temp the whole Tempest of the Central Sea. I mean it just reminds me of uh of the first X Men movies. Do you know what happens when a frog gets gets hit by a lightning scene? Mm -hmm. oh. Or a toad gets hit by lightning, excuse yeah. me. The same thing that happens to everything else. <laughs> no, that's not true. I've been hit by lightning twice. Thank you very much. But with that said, so, as far as core ability requirements, it is a it's Constitution and Resolve. Resolve is your spellcasting ability for your sorcerer spells, since the power of your magic relies on your ability to project your will into the world. You use your Resolve whenever a spell refers to your spellcasting ability. In addition, you use your Resolve modifier when making an attack roll with a spell you cast or skill attack you use. I should note that with um, Constitution and Resolve being, being, the, being at the forefront, I'm kind of reminded of how 13th Age described sorcerers, that they don't cast a spell, they uncork it. And I'm perfectly yeah. fine with it with this turn to making sorcerers the ca the caster for those who think subtlety is for wimps. <laughs> uh, 
because that's very cl that's very clearly what we're go what we're going with here. Indeed. Uh, now, as far as proficiencies, you gain simple proficiencies with s three weapon subcategories of your choice. You may not choose a subcategory with the heavy property, except for the heavy crossbow category. You are proficient in your constitution and resolve defenses. Makes sense. You learn one additional language of your choice. And we have a dev note. Sorcerers don't get a whole lot of proficiencies, no skills or artistries. Like other resolve-based classes, they emphasize a do-or-die style of play. Then we have Vitality. As a sorcerer, you have a number of vitality equal to half your level rounded up, plus your resolve modifier. In addition, you recover additional vitality equal to your resolve modifier whenever you push forward. So so far, so far, the vitality king is still the druid, I'd say. Yeah, but it does so much with its vitality if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Let's see, raising the death flag. All right, now we're getting to now we're getting into the shit. When a sorcerer raises the death flag, they are instantly restored to full HP. Their meta magic options no longer require them to expend vitality, nor the nor do they require the sorcerer to utilize their reaction when affecting another creature's spell. Their spells no longer require them to expend spell points, and they may choose three additional secondary options for spells they cast which do not count against the maximum number of secondary options they channel into a spell. <laughs> and as previously established, they uh, have the most spell points, recover the most spell points, and can do the most things with spells. So, uh... This is... This, this raising the death flag is going to result in, in, in a sorcerer rightfully going Nova. And considering that we've already decided that this guy, or at least that we've decided from what we've seen so far, that this guy is probably the guy with, with no subtlety, and also the guy who just kind of lets the power out rather than uh, channeling it. He, he's like, I'm holding it in all the time, and I'm just going to let it out and affect you because we understand what magic is, and it's most fundamental. Going Nova is the most appropriate term for this for the sorcerer. Mm -hmm. And this ba this basically means I raise the death spell, the death flag, and I cast all the fucking spells. <laughs> I just re I just realized that it's not too far removed from say um Lulu's limit break in FF10. <laughs> Or, um... Hmm. Tella casting Mateo even though he's at 0 HP and MP. Over and over and over again. Casting Meteo over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Well, if you... So, let's see. As a sorcerer, you start with one weapon of your choice, an adventuring kit of your choice, and a Tier 1 Rejuvenation Potion. Fairly standard, I'd say. So, first level features, you have innate spell casting. The and the the spells you know are granted to you by your archetype. Interesting, so we're doing archetypes right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. which you're able to which me, which means that which means that your origin actually matters more than it di than it did in vanilla. Of course. I mean in vanilla, it j vanilla your origin just granted you a a um extra set of spells in addition to the sorcerer spell book. Uh -huh. You're able to amplify the spells you cast by spending spell points. You gain a number of spell points as shown in the sorcerer spell casting table. For each spell point you spend, you may choose one additional secondary effect for your spell. The secondary effect limit chart in the sorcerer spell casting table shows the minimum um, so the maximum amount of secondary options you're able to channel into any one spell. The maximum number of spell points you may have at any given time is dependent on your level, and you gain all of your expended spell points after a rest. In addition, whenever you push forward, you get, regain a number of spell points depending on your level. The number of spell points you recover and your maximum spell points are shown on the class chart under recoverable spell points and maximum spell point, respectively. You do... 
You do not need to be holding a spell focus to gain access to the spell focus exclusive secondary options for spells. When you cast a spell while both hands are free, the threat range for that spell increases by one. At 5th, 11th, and 17th level, you may choose one additional secondary option each time you cast a spell without spending spell points. I'd just like to point out that at 20th level, they get 9 secondary effects per spell, 12 spell point recovery at rest, and a total of 16 spell points. There's also this nice dev note. Druids get more free secondary options. Inquisitors can substitute their weapon die for their spell die. Wizards, which we haven't gotten to, mm -hmm. get to create spell scrolls and store magic that way. But sorcerers are the most spellcasty of the spellcasters. They get the most spell points and are able to regenerate the most spell points when they push forward. Yep. The... Rec you for, you forgot the recoverable spell points. That's that's when you're pushing forward. When you rest, you just get all of them back. Yeah. And the and at first level, you're get you're starting with two spell points. You're getting all of them back when when you either rest or push forward. So we're off to, we're off to a we're off to a start. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. Let's see, next is sorcerer archetype. You gain the benefits of your archetype, basically um, sorceress origins, and you gain meta magic. Whenever you cast a spell, you may expend a vitality, no action required, and amplify that spell with a meta magic option from the list below. You may only activate one meta magic option on each spell unless otherwise noted. You may also use your reaction and expend a vitality when a creature within 30 feet of you casts a spell in order to use one of your metamagic features on that creature's spell. This includes both enemies and allies spells. Some metamagic options affect enemy spells differently than they affect friendly spells. If a metamagic option can affect an enemy spell, the effects will be detailed in the metamagic features description. At 14th level you get improved metamagic. You may channel two metamagic features into a single spell instead of one, and may do so when a creature casts a spell within 60 feet of you rather than 30 feet. You must pay the associated cost for each metamagic option th through using multiple metamagic options on another creature spell on only requires you to utilize a single reaction. So you have to spend two vitality for two features, but mm -hmm. still only one reaction to affect another creature spell. So, so there's a, there's actually a nice little list here. Yep. Um, I'd say a, I'd say a fair few of them are going to be relatively familiar. Um, yeah, I see a few that are pretty pretty familiar already. Yep. Careful spell. Choose a number of creatures up to your resolve modifier plus one. The spell automatically misses the the chosen creatures. Using this feature does not count against the number of meta magic features you may use on a single spell, though you must still expend a vitality to utilize it. You may apply this meta magic feature to an enemy spell. Choose a number of allies in the area up to your resolve modifier to a minimum of one. Chosen allies are hidden four against that spell. So you can't make them completely immune against an enemy spell, an enemy spell, but uh, you can certainly make them much, much harder to hit. Mm -hmm. This is also one of those features where you can apply it and it doesn't count against the hard meta magic limit of one. It's like, oh, you can apply this and something else. You just have to spend more vitality. Yep. I kind of wonder how much vitality you can dump into a single spell at this point. <laughs> oh, we'll get we'll get to that in a moment. Let's see. Then empowered spell. When the cast spell deals damage, you may re-roll a num a number of that spell's damage dice equal <clears throat> to your resolve modifier. You may choose which damage dice to re-roll, but you must use the new re re you must use the new rolls. Using this feature does not count against the number of metamagic features you may use on a single spell, though you must still expend a vitality to utilize it. Um, you can you can apply this metamagic feature to an enemy spell to an enemy spell which deals damage. Reroll a number of damage dice equal to your resolve modifier. You may choose which damage dice to reroll, but mu but must use the new rolls. Really, this is this is to allow you to reroll your ones and allow you to reroll the uh, enemy's max numbers. Mm -hmm. 
Let's see. Extended spell. Extend the range by 30 feet. Quickened spell. Activating this option allows you to d also deals you 1d6 physical damage for each secondary option channeled into the spell. You may change the cast time of the spell into a quick action, 15 feet. You may not use this feature on one of your own spells if you have already cast a spell this turn, and after using this feature, you may cast a spell on the same turn, but may not spend spell points on that spell. You may not use this feature on an ally spell if that ally has already cast a spell this turn, and after having this feature used on them, they may cast a spell on the same turn, but they but may not spend spend spell points on that spell. So, this essentially gives you the option uh, to cast a spell faster than a standard action, mm -hmm. and then take your standard action to cast another spell. But the second spell doesn't get any secondary options, because you can't spend... No, excuse me. The second spell doesn't get any, uh, any non-free secondary options because mm -hmm. you can't spend spell points but you know you still get three at level 20 you still have three free options so you can at least throw three free options into that second spell the first spell you can put as many secondary options as you normally could but each time you do you're taking 1d6 physical damage mm -hmm. that's interesting that's also uh, again risk for, risk versus reward yep i like it mm -hmm. i like it so then you have Heightened Spell. Add a plus four bonus to the spell's attack roll. You may use this feature after you see the roll, but before the GM has narrated its effects. And recur Recurring Spell, which has a, bit, has a bit more text. Activating this metamagic option also deals you 1d8 physical damage for each spell point that was channeled into the spell when the recurred spell hits. On your next turn, you may cast a copy of the original spell without spending spell points. Casting the copy still requires you to utilize your action as normal. The copy includes the spell's primary and base secondary effects, but not any additional effects gained from other features. For example, if a class feature extended the range of, the, of a spell, the recurring spell would not ca be cast with this feature, and this feature would need to be utilized again in order to be added to the spell. If the recurred spell missed, you are not de you are not dealt damage and may choose to recur the spell again on your next turn, taking damage only if the spell hits. You may not recur a recurred spell that hits. So basically, it gives you a copy of a spell you've already cast that you can just hold in reserve, and it, and if you miss with it, you can still continue to hold it in reserve. Mm -hmm. hmm. I like the dev note. I'll make this sound pretty at some point, but this point is not that point. <laughs> so the last the last of the metamagic options we have is Twin Spell. Activating this metamagic op option also deals you 1d6 physical damage for each secondary option that was channeled into the spell. You may choose a second target for the spell without expending additional spell points. If the targets of the twin spell overlap, you may only apply the effects of one instance of the spell. The twin spell uses the same role as the initial attack. In the case of a spell surge, you only take damage for the initial secondary options chosen, but are dealt 1d8 physical damage rather than 1d6. You may use this feature on an enemy's spell. Interesting. I kind of wonder why you'd want to use this feature on an enemy spell. Maybe make the twinned portion attack themselves. Or if it's a healing spell, I can see that. You know, get your healing off of them without really doing much. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'll have to see what Tanner says about that when he does his review. Yep. <clears throat> so at second level, you gain Font of Magic... Whenever you cast a spell, you may take 2d6 physical damage and channel an addition additional secondary effect into the spell without expending spell points. You may not use this feature multiple times on a, sing on a single spell. Doing so counts toward your secondary effect limit. This damage is reduced by your resolve modifier, minimum 2, but otherwise cannot be prevented in any way.
It's effectively a work effectively a workaround when it comes to your when it comes to secondary effects for spells. Mm-hmm. Um, at tenth level, your maximum vitality is increased by twice your resolve modifier rather than your resolve modifier. But okay. if if what we're if what we're seeing is any indication, um, you're going to be burning through spell. You're going to be burning through vitality really fast if uh, if you decide to be reckless on this. So improved font of magic just gives you instead of uh, half level rounded up plus resolve mod to half level rounded up plus two times resolve mod. Got mm -hmm. it. That's actually pretty useful for you know meta magic. <laughs> All that meta magic. Oh yeah. At fifth level, you gain a bonus um, spell feat, and you gain additional spell feat at eleventh and seventeenth level. And at 20th level, you gain Aetheric Manipulation. You gain an additional two reactions during the course of a round. These additional reactions may only be used to apply metamagic features to allies or enemy spells. If any of these reactions remain unspent at the start of a round, excluding the first round, in a threatening situation, you gain spell points equal to the number of unspent reactions... So if you don't spend those reactions, you get two more spell points. You recover additional vitality equal to twice your resolve modifier whenever you push forward instead of vitality equal to your resolve modifier. And nice. Let me scroll back up a little bit so I can see what your what your recoverable spell points are. So it's 12. So you recover 12 spell points at 20th level. Out of the total of 16 that you can have. Mm -hmm. And if you if you um, if you don't use the extra reactions, that's four that's 14. So you can basically blow through your spell points e e easily and still get them back. Yep. Just, just I just have th I just have this idea of somebody constantly casting fireball, going I can do this all night. <clears throat> I mean. I don't see why they couldn't. Yeah, throw, throwing around fireball like demo, like a demo man throwing around grenades. Except you have two eyes, so you can actually see where your balls are going. I mean, grenades. Mm -hmm. So then we get to the archetypes. And we start with elemental. Which I think, I think is self-explanatory. It doesn't matter whether it was elemental from a giant, a dragon, or an, or an, or an er, elemental energy in its purest form. That's what you got. So at first you gain elemental ancestry. You learn four spells from the elemental resonance. Fire, acid, ice, earth, lightning, poison, wind slash thunder, and aether. Are the, are the, are, is that resonance. Whenever you cast a spell focus spell, grant granted to you from your elemental ancestry feature, you may choose from among any of the secondary options that would be available to you from the other spells granted by that feature. Dev note. Meaning you can cast a fire spell, but add in some afflicted lightning from the lightning spell and make it blast everything in a spear around you around you from the ice spell or any combination that suits your fancy. <laughs> this sounds like my type of blaster caster. Yeah, the, now I'm starting to get 4E Sorcerer flashbacks. <laughs> but that's a good thing. Oh, yeah. Let's see. At third level, you gain Bombastic Spell. You gain access <laughs> to the Bombastic Spell metamagic option. You may add an additional secondary option into your spell as long as the secondary option increases the area of the spell's effect. Doing so does not count against the maximum number of secondary options, may which may be channeled into a spell. Yeah. So you're going to make this a really big bada boom. Mm -hmm. uh, fifth element references. Yeah. You also you also add that you also gain elemental resilience. Choose two of the following damage types: fire, ice, poison, acid, and lightning. You gain resistance to damage of the chosen types. 
At 11th level, you gain immunity to the chosen damage types. Right. Wait, I'm used immunity to the chosen to the chosen damage types rather than immunity. Um, I think that's a bit of a typo. <laughs> I think that's supposed to be resistance. Yeah, I think it's supposed to read immunity to the chosen types rather than resistance. Mm -hmm. So, might want might want to put that in, might want to put a note in there for him. Will do. Anyway, if you already have immunity to the chosen damage type, you may choose a different option among, from among the level 3 options and gain resistance to that instead. In addition, when damage is prevented by the damage immunity gained from this feature, you gain temporary hit points equal to the damage prevented by your immunity. Okay. That's fucking broken. <laughs> <clears throat> because if you're at high enough levels, at 11th level, uh, you, you're you're probably around what 40-ish HP, as we saw in some of those charts in the ancestry chapter. Um, <clears throat> if you're taking damage from a big fire spell and you've got fire immunity from this uh, from this feature, you could potentially have half your total HP as a t as now a temporary HP shield <laughs> tanky sorcerer is tanky this also this also means that 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 spellcaster who loves throwing fireballs um you effectively you're effectively not only making him fire oh god god damn it i just realized that with at um at 11th level you end up you end up starting to use dragon slayer magic You might want to elaborate for the uh, for the audience. There, You're Monk. fucking not so. <laughs> not only not only are you immune to not only are you immune to fire, you can eat fire and get and get healed. Well, it's still temporary HP, but it's but still, there's no up there's no upper limit on temporary HP. Let's see. At sixth level, you gain piercing spells, so you gain access to the piercing spell meta magic feature option. As far as piercing spell, you may grant a spell from your elemental ancestry feature the ability to ignore a tam target's damage resistance or transform a target's damage immunity to resistance. You may use this feature on other creatures' spells as long as the spell matches one given to you by your elemental ancestry feature. Nice. It's like, ah, you can't throw fireballs at me. I'm fireproof. You were. <laughs> Bitch, you thought. That's yeah. the, that's the that that is that is the definition of piercing spell. Mm -hmm. Bitch, you thought. Yep. And at seventeenth <clears throat> level, you gain elemental explosion. You may utilize your bombastic spell meta magic option twice on a single spell. Your piercing spell and bombastic spell metamagic options no longer cost vitality, and you may use either in conjunction with any of your other metamagic options. What the fuck? This time it was you that said it, <laughs> not me! Whoa! Now I get what it's like. <laughs> but, uh, yes, what the fuck indeed. Hmm... I'm just going to put piercing and bombastic on the single spell, and I still got other meta magic I can throw on there, too. Let's make it careful so it doesn't hurt my friends. Let's increase its range. Let's see. Uh, well, uh, elemental elemental um, archetype is already, is already off to a strong start. Um... Next is Cursed. Oh boy. Oh boy. I like the name of this one. I want to read that description. Go ahead. Magic is more than a wizard in his tower or a druid in her grove. You know this. 
your ancestors knew this as well. Magic can be ugly. It can twist, bend, break, and infest. You are the product of such infestation. Whether an ancestor was so thoroughly cursed that the remnants of the magic crept through your bloodline, whether they entered into some fey pact which now takes its toll, or whether they tarnished their soul in some unholy ritual, your blood is infused with the after effects of those gruesome acts. I love that. I love that. I have a feeling I'm going to like this archetype. So, first level, you gain Twisted Nature. You learn four of the following spells. Madness, Enthrall, Wither, Weird, Rejuvenation, Rift, Fate, or Light and Shadow. You also gain proficiency in one of the following artistries. Malediction or Restoration. Madness, Wither, Weird, and Rift, Malediction. I'm going to go for fucking your day up as much as possible. <laughs> I'm cursed. This is this is the classic, if I suffer, you all suffer with me, build. Hey, isn't that your happy place? <laughs> you are correct, sir. Uh, I could also see, that, like, the way this is described, I could also see this for those who want to play the um the old the old school psychic. <laughs> you know, mind fuckery for days. Anyway, at third level you gain infectious spell. Gaining the infection spell I think it's supposed to be infectious. Oh, sorry. Actually, actually let me let me fix that. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I got I I got I got the um I got the thing fixed. Yep. Um, yep. So, infectious spell. Whenever a condition is a, is inflicted by a by a spell from your twisted nature feature, you may inflict that condition on creatures within five feet of the target, as long as they were not already targeted by the spell. You may use this feature on other creatures' spells as long as the spell matches one given to you by your twisted nature feature. Ah. <sighs> So some I want I, I want to pair this with the um with the the, the one herald the the uh the oh what was it the I'm going now to look real quick the message of doom because they learn wither or madness mm -hmm. I'm a I'm gonna make your message of doom there uh, spread like a sickness amongst our enemies. So you also gain faded connections. Whenever you expend vitality in order to augment a spell you cast from your twisted nature feature, you may choose between the following effects: either a, creatures affected by that spell take additional damage equal to the number of vitality you expended times your resolve modifier the next time they would take damage during this encounter or for the next 10 minutes. This feature only affects creatures targeted by the spell and not those who are affected by your infectious curse feature. Or B, you may grant conscious allies within 30 feet of you temporary hit points equal to the number of, vi of expended vitality times your resolve modifier. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. Either way, that's really nice. Yep. At 6th level, you gain Insidious Spell. And which is the which gets you the Insidious Spell meta magic option. You may grant a spell from your Twisted Nature feature 
the ability to ignore a creature's resistances or immunities to conditions inflicted by that spell. You may use this feature on other creatures' spell as long as the spell matches one given to you by your Twisted Nature feature. So, this is, this is this is sounding like a this is sounding like the people who want to throw around debuffs. Uh, so you also gain permanency when a spell from your Twisted Nature feature, including those cast by allies within 60 feet of you, applies a negative condition to an enemy. You may expend one vitality, no action required, to have the conditions imposed by that by that stat spell by that spell, Curse an Enemy. When you curse an enemy, the curse follows the same rules for curses imposed by the Malediction Artistry. While the curse is in effect, your maximum vitality is reduced by one. At ele... So, it's still fitting, in, still fitting in with the theme. At 11th level, you gain Curse of the Twisted. If a spell you cast would target a creature's strength defense, you may have it target its intuition defense. If a spell you cast would target a creature's dexterity defense, you may have it target its wits defense. If a spell you cast would target a creature's constitution defense, you may have it target its resolve defense. If a spell you cast would target a creature's intuition defense, you may have it target its strength defense. If a spell you cast would target a creature's wits defense, you may have it target its dex... It's Dexterity Defense. And if it's Resolve Defense, you may have it target its Constitution Defense. Basically, you can flip-flop the defense to the uh, to the opposite defense type. If, mm -hmm. it's the, if it's a physical defense you're targeting, you can have it attack the, the equivalent magical defense, and vice versa. As we've seen with the, with the six attributes in this particular... Uh, in this particular... Ascension away from vanilla 5e, and it truly is an ascension. Um, each of them has their own counterpart within both sides strength with intuition, dexterity with wits, and constitution with resolve. Mm -hmm. So you can flip flop the defense that you're, that you're targeting from physical to magical or magical to physical, depending on what the initial target is. I love that. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Oh, this spell targets your strength defense, and you're a really strong dude. But it doesn't look like you're so good with with uh, with making those connections around you, those instinctive little hints. So I'm gonna target your intuition instead. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, I hope you like having terrible nightmares of a doom you can't get away from for the rest of your life. Your life will be very short, by the way. So. Mm -hmm. And at 17th level, you gain Irresistible Decay. Creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you have a minus 2 penalty to all their defenses, and your Insidious Spell metamagic option no longer costs vitality, and you may use it in conjunction with any of your other metamagic options. There's a grouping of bad guys within 30 feet of me. All of those bad guys have a neg to do their defenses. I'm going to choose the guy in the middle who has all the other guys within five feet of him. Insidious spell. Drop it on his head. Have fun! <laughs> and the third one, the third one that we have is Arcane. Wizards tinker in things they do not understand. They pull at the web and its rippling lines are distorted, forever changed by the hands which fractured them. The fabric of reality shifts, and the same is true for its inhabitants. Arcane sorcerers are, build, are born from such tinkering. They may have descended from a family of servants who, for a number of years, lived in a wizard's tower, or their ancestors may have worked in a land infused with aetheric magic. One thing is for certain. Arcane sorcerers are the product of a fracture of the web mutating its surroundings. Warpstone! Lovely! I love it. So, at first level, you gain Aetheric Infusion. You learn the Aetheric spell and five other spells of your choice, and you gain a spell feat of your choice. Hawaii! 
At third level, you gain Aetheric Web. You may use two metamagic features on a single spell. You must expend vitality for each feature. You Hold can't... on. Hold, Hold on. Hold on, 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 hold on. That is... That is... 11 levels before you have that ability from base. Because improved metamagic is 14th level. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? That's kind of... Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, we can continue. If you use, me you may reduce the vitality cost of your meta magic features by one. If you use multiple meta magic features, this feature is applied to the total cost of them for that spell and not to each individual feature. This feature cannot reduce the quicken spell and twin spell cost to zero vitality. So if you only use one meta magic, and it's not quickened or twinned, you don't spend any vitality. Or if you just do two of them, and you've you've cut double meta magic in the cost for double meta magic in half. Yes, you and, have. Uh, uh, hooray! And at seventeenth level, you gain Child of the Web. You may use up to three metamagic features on a single spell rather than two. You must expend a vitality for each feature. In addition, you may reduce the vitality cost of your metamagic features by an additional one for a total of two. If you use multiple metamagic features, this feature is applied to the total cost of them for that spell and not to each individual feature. This feature cannot reduce the quicken spell and twin spell cost to zero vitality. So, does this mean that at, that a 20th level arcane sorcerer could use four metamagic options? We need that clarification, because at level 14 you, in, the, in the base class, you're still supposed to get improved metamagic. Yeah. So that is a clarification we do need. 17th, at 17th level, does an etheric, does an etheric uh, archetype sorcerer get four total metamagic options. I don't think that was the intention here. I'm pretty sure he meant for them to only have three. But in that case, that means the improved metamagic in the in the base part of the class kind of just stops being useful. And he wanted to go for no empty classes or empty class slots. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely some clarification there, Tanner. This is a big point of clarification. Now, granted, as powerful as four options would be, it's that's still you spending four, or actually in this case, three, vi three um, vitality. And two, two, two vitality. Because mm -hmm. remember, two. you can reduce the cost of your vitality by two. Yeah. It is... St but then again, I, I get the feeling that the theme for the arcane is, is that they are the most vitality efficient. That and... Uh, they're they're a build your own. Um, you get a theoric and five other spells of your choice rather than being um, consigned to a specific list of particular spells. Mm -hmm. So at sixth level, you gain bonus spell feat. You gain a spell casting feat as a bonus feat, obviously. You also gain a theoric vitality. Your maximum vitality total increases by two, and you recover one additional vitality whenever you push forward. Very cool. At eleventh level, you get you gain exponential spell. You gain access to the exponential spell meta magic option, where you increase the threat range of the spell by three. So the threat range of the spell now becomes equivalent to the auto hit range of the spell. Yep. <laughs> and of course, we already covered levels the level 17 capstone with Child of the Web. Mm -hmm. um, which, again, we need that clarification on Child of the Web. 
Yeah, I'm I'm not opposed to a top to a top arcane sorcerer being able to use four options. Neither um, am I. It's just something that needs to be made clear. Exactly. Now that being that being said, um, there is a there is a note that he's he has the inklings of an idea for a more item and ritual based sorcerer, but nothing too substantial yet. Um, I'd say I'd say if you're gonna do I'd say if you're gonna do the, I'd say if you're gonna do that that particular sorcerer should be for those who want to fulfill the art the um, Eberron esque artificer um, fantasy. Well, and honestly, he's technically said that with with the dev note we read earlier about what what type of spellcasters do what, such as wizards are able to create scrolls mm -hmm. to store spells. The whole engraving magic into a permanent item seems to be taken with that specific archetype. Uh, yes. Rich, when you think of magical items and rituals, it's very much a more wizard-like thought in your head. You know, the wizards have their towers and their staffs and their magical circles and their scrolls, their their rings and their their wands, etc. Whereas a sorcerer, you imagine, is just pulling the magic out of themselves and releasing. So I'm not sure if a if a item and ritual based sorcerer would be the right the right uh, fit for the for the type of uh, class fantasy or the, the you know the type of fantasy you want to go for. Um, because, again, using the words like blaster caster or a more, um, or some of the things that are said in, in some D&D books about how the sorcerer is a more uh, intuitive type of magic caster, one who just simply pulls the energy forth and, and knows how to shape it. Um, I'm going to be honest, that sounds a whole lot like anime uh almost any anime magical user than most western fantasy magic users the first um, name I that would... came up uh, i'm surprisingly the first name that came to mind is orphan yeah or uh or as you pointed out earlier uh natsu natsu would actually would if i'm good if i'm gonna go this route um an elemental sorcerer is natsu a arcane sorcerer is orphan. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say for a a um, cur I do want to be. I I'm tempted to be the smartass and say that a cursed sorcerer is an is an edge lord, uh, but no. Oh, a cursed sorcerer is Lena Inverse. Never ever to have boobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The problem, the problem is a lot of her spells disqualify her from be, from being a from being a cursed one. Um, oh, Dragon Slave itself is in, is uh, is invoking the darkest powers of hell, the Lord of Darkness of the Four Realms himself. Okay. Um, actually, you know, you this might be a bit of a stretch, but you know who might you know who might be willing to fit a fit a um. A cursed um, sorcerer. Who's that? Dark Schneider. Okay, I'll allow it. <laughs> I'll allow it. I was gonna. I was gonna. Cause, and be and it, and bar, barring barring that, you're t any anybody who's do. Barring that, I could go with um, Bridget Delacroix from the Scion games. Mm-hmm. Now, given the fact that she's the daughter of Baron Somdi, and her whole thing is voodoo magic with a little bit of necromancy. I, I have a nice cheeky answer for you. Throw it on me. <laughs> Camille be done! But he allows <laughs> all the souls of the dead into himself! Uh, I, 
I can't argue God with damn that. it, Gundam and your new tight magic bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I can't ar I can't really argue with that. Oh. Just just remember guys, the best version of Universal Sentry Char is four vaginas. <laughs> sad Sad thing is it's funny because it's true. Especially the best meme that ever came from Zeta Gundam. I came here to laugh at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Quattro Badina. Wearing sunglasses. You know he's a fucking Char because he is Char. Everybody looks at him and goes, that's just Char with sunglasses and long hair. And all he says to people is things like, I came here to laugh at you. I'm sorry. That is the best smug Char face ever. <sighs> of course, it's not like he's being modest given that, given that, his, <laughs> given that his mech is fucking gold. <laughs> Yakushiki. The Type 100. That's what that stands for. Mm. Yakushiki. <laughs> oh, but yes. Uh, a cursed caster. Um. Man, if I had to think of an anime cursed caster. Um. <sighs> I know it's tempting to bring to bring someone from Kaisen, but that's a little too easy. Well, no, actually, um, y y Yuji Itadori is a, it would be the, the like the direct result of someone cursed by something, given unimaginable po unimaginable power over fate and the t and the ties that bind. Of course, I love Jujutsu Kaisen. I'm not gonna lie; mm -hmm. that show is amazing. Uh, the the manga, amazing, and the fact that the magic has rules and the rules are consistent is fucking great. But now I digress. This yeah. is, now we're way off. We're way in the fucking weeds. Yeah. Um. Uh, the, but the. But the th the key thing the key thing with it is that, and to, to be honest, the that whole that whole ri that whole uh, a ritual based sorcerer, I feel like I feel like with how the sorcerer is dis is presented here, that's a bit of an that's a bit of an oxymoron. No no offense no offense Tanner, but the idea but the idea but. The idea of a item in ritual based sorcerer, um, I feel I feel like it do it doesn't really fit the spontaneous do or die nature that this cla that this class is trying to fulfill. Yeah, it's way too methodical. It's something that's more wits based than anything, mm -hmm. and I imagine that the wizard is a probably a wits based class. Well, and we'll end up learning that when we get to when we get to that one. Indeed. Um, but, yeah, the, uh, I don't know, um, if you need another archetype, and I don't know that you do, because I don't, I see the major do-or-die spontaneous casting types pretty much well covered here, the, the types of class fantasies you would go for. I mean, all my joking about Lena inverse aside, she's definitely an elemental caster. Mm -hmm. Like, you could throw her an element, there you go, there's, there's Lena inverse right there. <laughs> um and so I I mean the only other uh no I can't, I can't really think of another type of caster archetype that would fit here. I I, I think the three that he has are really good. Mm -hmm. I really like the sorcerer class. I know I've said that about every class so far. I think it's a testament that you have said that about every class so far. Especially the Inquisitor. I really like the Inquisitor. I know I want to play all the classes at least once, but if we if we only get one play test, I'm probably going to play an Inquisitor. Mm -hmm. And even with even with that, I can. S 
the f the fact that the fact that the met that meta magic can af can affect not only your spells but other people's spells goes into that whole thing that he wanted to do of not make of not making people armies of one. Yes. I just thought of something as well. I forgot to check the uh, paladin blessing for sorcerers. Let's do that. Yeah. Your ally may choose an additional secondary effect for their spells. Without expending spell points, the secondary effect counts towards that ally's secondary effect limit. So the the blessing from the paladin give this gives the sorcerer one more free secondary effect. Um, and then with the paragon who also gets a boon from blessing someone, whenever your ally casts a spell. You gain temporary hit points equal to two times the amount of secondary options channeled into the spell. <laughs> so a paragon who blesses a sorcerer gives the sorcerer additional a free secondary option. That sorcerer, in return, gives the, <laughs> gives the paragon double secondary options in temp hit points. Ah. <sighs> That's that's great. I love that. That's synergy. That's another one. Like you said, you wanted to avoid armies of one. So much class synergy, and the class synergy makes me happy. Mm -hmm. I am not gonna lie. Especially since this this particular set, the the reason why the cla the class synergy in these things makes me happy is because I've had I've had to put up way too many times with the nenad. Mm -hmm. Neutral evil ninja assassin drow. Mm -hmm. I e I e those those people who want those people who want to be awesome on who want to be awesome on their own or um or or um think that think that being a rogue means that they have to be like like solid snake or Sam Fisher. Yeah. Or 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 for the people like us, Riki Maru. Ikimaru, yeah. When in when in reality this is still a this is still a cooperative affair. Now that be that being said, next is next week we are going to be tackling the vessel, which is basically gonna be our um our equivalent to the warlock, for all intents and purposes, which, uh, which obviously, we have a bit of history with the warlock, given that the level up episode on that class was a two-hour show. <laughs> Where Ash we is not, <laughs> Ash is not here to help me fix the broken things. I don't think there's going to be anything broken in this instance. I know that's. <laughs> I'm just. I'm just saying there's not going to be that sort of delay because Ash is not here to argue about it. Well, that and we that and we don't have to try and rebuild it because well the big pro the big problem that we have with the warlock is the the plot of some of them making a pact um doesn't come up doesn't come up mechanically all that much or narratively for that matter. Yep. I don't th I don't think I don't think it would be fair to hold to hold that standard to heavens and heresies, though, because different ball game it's it has a clearly defined setting with its with its with its specific rules. Yep, and you never know when we look at the vessel, the thing they may be a vessel for or of is uh it may tie in very very closely narratively and definitely mechanically. Mm -hmm. But with that said, that is going to do that is going to do it for the, for this particular episode of Valley of the Judge. We'll be back here next week with the ne with the next class in this little adventure. We're we're probably get we're probably going to be um out of out of the classes entry and in, and into some of the crazier stuff by the end of the month. Right, let me check let me check something. Yeah, we'll be done with classes by Black Friday. A Black Friday. He's only saying that because he's black. 
Fuck you. <laughs> it's been so long since I got to make that joke. Yay! Anyways, but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>